The admin had a nice arrangement with the local government. A few of his contacts kept him appraised of any missions that could be used for training, and if the instructors accepted, the local forces would stand back and let the trainees have a crack at the problem. This was a pretty agreeable arrangement for all parties involved. Now, we didn't have any illusions about the quality of our trainees. They were utter shit. But this was the milkiest of milk runs. A feral orc raid had crawled out of a section of the swamps where they bred, sacked a few farms, and then ran back to their hovels with the loot. A fair-sized counteroffensive was being formed by the locals to purge the nest, possibly with the help of the other team's trainees, but we knew that was far out of our pathetic batch's league. Instead, we had our eyes on one of the sacked farms, where a few struggling Gretchen and Squigs were still wandering around. Our trainees could fly in and have a nice simple game of Hunt the Gretchen, while we watched and made sure everyone stayed safe. It was about the easiest mission you could ask for. Hell, a grocery run in a lower hive hab block was more dangerous. These were feral Gretchen and completely ordinary Squigs. They were weak, stupid, cowardly, and armed with nothing but knives and pointy sticks. Our trainees would be armed with high-quality ranged weapons, and they could just slowly sweep the area, gunning down the little buggers before they even got close. We put together a clean and simple plan of attack, made sure everyone understood their role, and even checked their weapons for them. There was no way that anything could go wrong. The op was practically foolproof. We would have trusted it to a bunch of kids with slingshots. It was amazing how hard they screwed it up. The locals had a cordon set up around the farm to keep the orcoids contained, and had given us a command tent to sit in while the trainees deployed. This meant we were a few hundred meters away when the screaming started, but from what we could piece together when the smoke settled, it went something like this. Squad 3 was advancing across the southern field when their gunner, the scribe who'd picked the heavy stubber, spotted a Gretchen fighting with a squig in a nearby ditch. We heard him call in the sighting, and then both he and a squad mate opened fire. A few seconds later, they stopped firing and announced their intention to advance and confirm the kill. The heavy weapons scribe walked over to the Gretchen and Squig, but instead of just headshotting them both and moving on, he prodded them with the barrel of his stubber. The Squig jumped up and bit his ankle, causing the scribe to fall face first into the ditch. This, in turn, prompted the wounded Gretchen to latch onto his head and start scratching and biting like only an angry Gretchen can. The scribe leapt to his feet, flailing his arms and screaming over the open channel until his squad mate removed the Gretchen. Unfortunately, said removal was performed using a hand cannon, and while the Gretchen was very thoroughly removed, so was most of the scribe's head. Then, while the team killer panicked and tried to perform first aid on a headless corpse, a second unnoticed Gretchen seized the abandoned heavy stubber. In the end, there were seven deaths, four serious injuries, and three arrests. Of the seven deaths, only three were directly caused by the Greenskins. The first was the team killer, who was gunned down by the Gretchen with the stubber. Another pair of Gretchen accounted for a cleric who had a little too much faith in the Emperor's protection, and too little sense to run when his gun ran dry. The final one was a scribe who dove for cover in a mulch pit, which was already occupied by a half dozen squigs. As for the others, good old-fashioned friendly fire took down the poor PDF trooper who killed the Gretchen with the stubber as well as the scribe whose death started the whole mess. The last two deaths were commissar-related. Most of the stubber-armed Gretchen's fire had been directed at Squad 5. The Xenos poorly aimed shots probably hadn't come anywhere near actually hitting them, but the tracers flying overhead were enough to spook the two scribes in the squad. The two nerds ran for it, ignoring the orders and accusations of cowardice coming from the cadet commissar in charge of their squad. Enraged by this blatant cowardice and disregard for his authority, the commissar drew his sidearm and placed three rounds through one of the scribes' backs and drew a bead on the other. Before he could get the shot off, though, a stray round, which neither the criminal or PDF trooper in his squad saw the source of, took him in the head. Someone stabbed his corpse a few times as well, but we put that down to a Gretchen, 
who must have somehow got a hold of a Type 7 Princeps special switchblade. As far as injuries went, the worst one was a cleric who got badly burned when he used his flamer inside an enclosed space. An enclosed space that just so happened to be made of wood and filled with hay. Aside from that, two trainees were badly hit by stray shots, and a scribe broke both of his legs when he tried to take cover in what proved to be a very deep and very dry well. There were a few dozen lesser injuries spread across the whole group, but those were the only really nasty ones. All in all, we lost 11 men, nearly a quarter of our trainees, but that wasn't the end of it. We'd provided all the trainees with combeats, figuring that good communication would help prevent screw-ups. None of us had thought to limit what frequencies they could transmit on. One of the panicking scribes had decided the situation was foobar and called for backup. This by itself wasn't a bad thing. Hell, we were the ones who taught them to do it. Calling for help when shit got tough was a nice, sane reaction, and we all endorsed it but not over the emergency channel that everyone within 50 clicks was linked to. As our squad mopped up the few surviving greenskins and Doc started triaging the wounded, the cavalry arrived. Several platoons of local PDF, a pair of chimeras, and a half dozen flyers descended on the farm, all of them intent on rescuing our trainees from some sort of surprise attack by the orcs. We just barely managed to prevent another round of friendly fire. The reinforcements did help Doc treat the wounded and might have saved a few lives, but it was just about the most embarrassing moment in our careers. Sarge was vibrating between incandescent rage and horrible shame as he talked to officer after officer, thanking them for the help and assuring them that the situation was under control. Doc kept himself busy with the wounded and avoided talking to anyone while Twitch and Cutter collected all the surviving trainees. Nubby just vanished. He tended to do that when people started asking awkward questions. The cherry on top of everything was when another group of flyers landed and the other training teams stepped out with their spiffy-looking recruits in tow. They looked over the dead and wounded, asked a few of our trainees what had happened, then walked over to where Sarge was negotiating the release of three trainees who attempted to appropriate a chimera and desert. Words were had. None of us were strangers to the odd reaming. It was just part of being a guardsman. In a way, people yelling at you is almost comforting. It's a reminder that the world hasn't changed and you're still right where you always were, at the bottom of the pile getting shit on by everyone else while you hold their asses up. Any of us could stoic our way through a dressing down without blinking. This one crossed the line, though. It was one thing to be chewed out by your superiors, in private, for mistakes made by you and your men. It's quite another thing to be berated by a group of your colleagues in front of your subordinates and allies for every damned screw-up since the Emperor decided that Horus would make a good war master. They even had the trainees chime in, whining about unfair treatment and poor lesson quality. That surviving cadet commissar was especially vocal, throwing out accusations of incompetence, cowardice, and heresy. Sarge got the worst of it. Being the nominal superior and first member of the squad they could find, the rest of us watched as he went from embarrassed to ashamed to angry back to ashamed, then straight past angry, furious, and murderous to a sort of zen state. The man was beyond anger, beyond shame, and beyond fear. He was cold and calculating, and was taking note of every single thing they said. The lecture petered to an end when the psyker on the other team started looking nervous and pulling at her teammates, suggesting that they still had a mission to do, and they really ought to be going right now. The other team got back into the gunships and flew away. Twitch asked if he should hit his detonators before they got out of range. Sarge just shook his head. We gathered everyone up and headed back to base. There was no talking during the flight or when we landed. No reprimands, no lectures, no punishments, just directions to get some sleep. 
That night, we reevaluated our lesson plans. This would not happen again. PT started an hour before dawn. Anyone who didn't get up was dumped out of bed, tied by the leg to a servitor, and dragged out onto the field. There were no separate groups this time. Everyone was doing the same drills we'd done as snot-nosed recruits. If you complained, you'd got a licking from Sarge or Cutter, and if you collapsed, you got a stim shot from Doc or were left where you fell. If we thought you were malingering, Nubby would go over and give you a few kicks. Never since he got those augmetic legs, Nubby could really put the boot in. Once the sun was good enough, we led, or dragged them all to the firing ranges, where Twitch had laid out all of their weapons. Next to the rows of fancy firearms and melee weapons were several large crates which the admin had busted his ass to get overnight. Sarge walked down the line of sweating trainees and asked each one to go get their weapons. When they went to pick up their auto gun or flamer or crossbow, it was yanked out of their hands and they were given a battered laser gun and a dull bayonet instead. This triggered a few complaints from the stupider recruits. They raised several points about the low quality of the weapons and their inexperience with them. And then they tried to demand their old guns back. Sarge calmly explained that they were getting the Lay's guns because shut up and soldier, soldier. Then he hit anyone who kept complaining. They got the message pretty quickly, and we outfitted everyone with a standard guardsman's kit with optional toothless chainsword. Well, almost everyone. The remaining cadet commissar refused. He kept a death grip on his weapons and launched into a tirade about dignity and such, which ended with him being clubbed over the head by Cutter and dragged away by one of the servitors. That night we stripped him, wrapped him in duct tape, and shipped him to the other training base with a note saying he'd requested a transfer. He was not missed. The next few days were nothing but PT and weapons drills. There were no team exercises, no demonstrations, and no lectures. Nothing but sweat, yelling, and as much food and sleep as they could get. No one was exempt. It didn't matter if you were old or weak or overweight. The only way to get a break was to be too sick or injured to stand. And the second doc or the base surgeon okayed it, you were back on the field. None of us knew how to be or train proper inquisitorial agents but we damn well knew how to soldier. We were going to make every one of them into a guardsman, or kill them trying. Once everyone began to adapt to the new regimen, we split them into squads and made the PDF troopers squad leaders. With both the commissars gone, the troopers really started to shine. Every one of them proved to be a good leader, and they were put in charge of keeping their squaddies in line and leading the drills. After all, they'd been through boot before and knew exactly how it should work. With most of the basic training being handled by the troopers, we started doing demos and lectures again. This time, we didn't try to fit our lessons to the trainees' roles. Instead, we just focused on teaching what every guardsman should know and didn't put up with any arguments. It didn't matter whether or not it was something that an inquisitorial agent needed to know. We said it was important, and they were going to learn it, whether they wanted to or not. Twitch taught demolitions and defusal. He made sure every trainee knew how to plant explosives, set traps, put up alarms, and at least appreciated how tricky defusal was. He would rig realistic-looking and sounding explosives under their beds, and periodically send servitors to check their perimeter security in the middle of the night. None of the trainees liked him, but they learned fast. Doc and Sarge made sure everyone knew standard Imperial Guard combat doctrine or at least the useful parts. Chances were they'd never need to know the correct way to call in an artillery strike or when to dig a foxhole. But it had saved our lives in the past, so they were going to learn it. The field medicine lessons were a little more useful. And there were even some nice demos when the trainees hurt themselves. Doc practically glowed with pride the first time he got to demonstrate how to treat a lays gun wound on a whimpering priest. Cutter mostly stuck to close-quarters combat training, though he did throw in a few confusing lessons on the proper filling of Munitorum paperwork. There were still problems with the scribes being afraid of him, but the PDF troopers were usually able to assist, 
generally by abusing the terrified scribe until they decided it was easier to face Cutter. Nubby's lectures were dedicated to scrounging, weapon maintenance, and how much criminality you could get away with. The shadier trainees found the lessons surprisingly educational and started warming up to the little bugger. The rest of us didn't ask where they went on their field trips. We all came together to teach our single most important class, not dying in the Inquisition. Now that we had established a proper respectful atmosphere, our stories were much better received. We started slowly and laboriously going over every single battle we'd fought and every death we'd witnessed. We pointed out how explosives solved almost every problem, how psychers tended to ruin everything for everyone, and often our problems were caused by our superiors. We crammed their heads with little pieces of common sense, each one backed up by horrible death or surprising victory, and made sure they could repeat each and every one back to us. It might not have been the traditional Inquisition curriculum, but we hoped that none of our scribes would wind up reading random demonic tomes and that our clerics wouldn't die leading suicidal charges. Of course, everything wasn't magically better. Some of the trainees couldn't take the strain and others tried to desert. We didn't waste any time on frail ones. They were handed over to the administrator in the hopes that he'd find place for them somewhere else. The deserters were retrieved and fitted with a good old-fashioned penal legion collars for a few days while we explained how preferable death was to angering the bloody Inquisition. After that was fully explained, we removed the collars and offered them another chance to run. There were no takers. Finally, there were a few recruits who were just so abysmally bad with their weapons that we just gave up on them. There's only so much you can do for someone who hits themselves more consistently than their target. Anyway, between the incompetence, the wounded, and the unfit, we lost another eight trainees before we started doing exercises again. But the ones who could hack it performed much better than they had before. We ran them through the usual guard training drills, complete with pig guts and razor wire. Everyone hated it, and even the PDF troopers complained about the stupidity of learning trench warfare as an inquisitorial agent. But they still went through the exercises, and that's all we cared about. We kept making the drills worse and worse, with Twitch adding dozens of little surprises, Doc and the base cogboys transforming the servitors into horrible monstrosities, and Nubby bellowing horribly retarded orders at them while they drilled. They bitched, they moaned, and they began to really hate our guts. But that hatred was the final ingredient they needed to really bring them together. When we started the competitive exercises again, they actually worked like teams. The scribes were still the weak link in most squads, but their squad mates and leaders began to actually work to support them, instead of ignoring or mocking them. They were doing damn well, but we didn't let them get overconfident. If a team was kicking too much ass, we'd enter the exercise ourselves and show them how it was really done. After a few months of grueling training, things were definitely starting to shape up, and we began to think about other projects. None of us, except maybe Cutter, had forgotten the way the other team had lectured us in front of everyone. It might have been justified, and we couldn't deny that it had been what really kicked us into gear, but they'd crossed several lines and we felt a little revenge was called for. Nothing too bad, mind you. After all, the training had to continue. Just enough to put them in their place. Maybe boost our trainees' morale a little. Now, anyone can hatch a revenge plot, but it takes a special type of person to come up with one that perfectly balances nefariousness, aggravation, embarrassment, and quasi-legality. Specifically, you need someone with a complete lack of scruples, a penchant for antagonizing behavior, and what might be called a criminal mind. Which is to say, someone like Nubby Nubs. Of course, we didn't just let him plan it all himself. We'd learned that lesson. But he had a few 
very interesting ideas which served as the basis for our plot. The admin was asked to keep an eye out for a few things that might fit the bill, and before long we got lucky. A handful of carefully worded messages were sent, some palms were greased, and a few interesting rumors were started. Soon, both inquisitorial training teams were informed that some mass disappearances were happening in the slums of one of the planet's major cities. This was the perfect opportunity for the trainees to test their investigative skills. We suspended our drills, called in some flyers, and got the trainees disguised as harmless civilians, which is to say that we told them to leave their helmets behind and throw coats over their flak armor. Once their cunning disguises were in place, Sarge gathered everyone up and informed them of the situation. He explained what we'd heard and who we'd heard it from, and then asked them to remember the first rule of being a guardsman. Of course, there are a few first rules of being a guardsman, and there was a little confusion about which one Sarge meant. It wasn't the gun is always loaded, stay the fuck in cover, or if at first you don't succeed, call in an airstrike, and it definitely wasn't it's not stealing if they're not from your unit and they didn't really need it. Nubby got a hard look from Sarge after that one. With a weary sigh, Sarge explained that the first rule of being a guardsman in the Inquisition is, if the job looks hard, make sure you actually have to do it first. None of the trainees seemed impressed with this piece of wisdom. At least, not until the rest of us volunteered some reasons why these disappearances might not be their problem. Then, because subtlety is completely overrated, we also suggested a few things that could be done with their time in the city, if this turned out to be someone else's problem. That got them thinking. As everyone boarded the flyers, we heard the squad leaders talking. They were already brainstorming who they could dump this mess on, and what to do with their R&R &R afterwards. Bless their weasley little hearts. There was no point messing around with subtle entrances. We just landed in the largest police barricade, blatantly flashed our credentials, and turned things over to the trainees. We watched, tears in our eyes as they practically marched onto the scene, looking exactly like a bunch of guardsmen trying unsuccessfully to look like civvies. They were growing up so fast. The squads split up and stomped around the cordoned area with a complete lack of subtlety, loudly asking questions about whether there were any evil cults, demons, or mutants around. If you knew where to look, you could see the other team's cleverly disguised or concealed trainees staring with their mouths open. Within minutes, one of their instructors appeared out of the shadows and asked us just what in the Emperor's name we thought we were doing here. While Sarge was the one the agent approached, the whole squad stepped back and let Nubby be the spokesman. It was just funnier that way. The conversation was needlessly long and incredibly aggravating for the agent. It was hard as hell to keep a straight face as Nubby ignored accusations of incompetence and blatantly lied about our trainee's expertise in tracking, interrogation, and general investigation. Eventually, the exasperated agent gave up on logic and tried bartering, prompting Sarge to step in and cut a deal. Our trainees were pretty much done here, so we'd off and investigate somewhere else, in exchange for the other team agreeing to hold nightly meetings with us to discuss findings and progress. After all, if they were so much better than us, our trainees needed to see how it was done, and maybe, just maybe, our boys would find something they didn't. That done, we marshaled the trainees up and left the area. Once everyone was back in the flyers, we handed operational control over to the squad leaders and adopted the role of observers. One of us tagged along with each group as they followed their leads, answering any questions they had and occasionally making rather unsubtle suggestions. That night, everyone met up in a nice warehouse near the local PDF base. To our delight, one of the squads had attained it simply by asking nicely, and had split their day securing the perimeter and sneaking in naps. As the meeting time approached, a few of the other team's trainers and trainees found their way in and provided comm links to the members in the field. 
When everything was set up, Sarge shouted our troops into order, and suggested that both teams should take turns presenting the facts they'd gathered. The other training team's leader agreed. The agent explained that his trainees at the scene had found signs of a struggle and a few emblems that matched no known cult, imperial or otherwise. He talked a lot about footprints, dropped items, and other stuff that none of us listened to. When he wound down, Sarge thanked him and asked Doc's squad to present their findings. The squad leader stepped forward and made his report in a nice, clear parade ground voice. His team had gone to the local Arbites precinct and asked if they had seen any heretics, demons, xenos, or mutants recently, and if they knew any reason that groups of people would be disappearing. They had, of course, not seen anything, and suggested looking for slavers or PDF recruiters as a cause of the disappearances. Sarge thanked the trainee and turned the floor back over to the agent. Neither he nor his trainees seemed very impressed with the short report but they didn't make any comments and continued with their findings. The other team's trainees had tracked down a few witnesses and examined their minds and blah 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 no psychic activity, but definite signs of cults, blah blah blah. Once he was done, Sarge's team reported that none of the local temples had seen any Xenos, demons, or mutants, but the Church of the Divine Man and his living saints was pretty empathetic about the third convocation of the Emperor's Blessing being a bunch of heretics. They had also suggested that the large disappearances were a sign of imminent rapture, or that the Mechanicus was making an extra-large batch of servitors. By then, the agent was getting a little frustrated, and had obviously noticed how little attention most of our trainees paid to his team's findings. Though we were at least making sure none of them fell asleep. One of his trainees gave an exceedingly boring report about surveillance records and people wearing matching robes, which is, of course, a classic sign of cultists. Some of our trainees snickered at this. Twitch's team had chatted with the local PDF before securing the warehouse we were in, and verified that they hadn't seen anything weird. The PDF had also implied that maybe all of the disappearing people had just suddenly decided to move to a different city, and it probably wasn't anything sinister. At this point, the agent and his trainees began to raise objections about the quality of our investigation. They seemed to think that all we were doing was just asking random people if anything was wrong, then accepting whatever they said. None of us saw anything wrong with this, though, so we just ignored their objections until they got on with their own reports. Another batch of the other team's trainees had done some snooping in the sewers, and found a few underworld establishments with mixed success. But those that weren't waylaid by gangers had, of course, found more evidence of cultist activity. A short argument was triggered by a nameless wise-ass in the audience, pointing out that the agent and his trainees could probably find evidence of cultist activity in their breakfast cereal. The mood was not improved by Nubby's team helpfully confirming a sighting of one of the other trainees being worked over with a pipe wrench in the alley. They had thought about intervening, but didn't want to blow the man's cover. So instead, they asked the wrench wielder for directions to a notorious local bar, and left the trainee to his super-secret mission. After that, they visited several local underworld leaders, verified that they hadn't seen anything fishy or perpetrated any mass kidnappings, and politely asked them to not actually kill anyone until the investigation was over. The criminals had suggested that the disappearances might have been caused by a press-ganging band from a navy or merchant vessel. On the way out, they had spotted the battered trainee laying in a trash pile, and had generously paid a few children to drag him to a public Medicaid. The agent was starting to turn a funny shade of red now, and the report from Cutter's team was the final straw. They had gone to the local administratum headquarters, but couldn't get an appointment until tomorrow, and had decided to just call it a day. All of us were accused of horrible incompetence, astounding laziness, and quite a few other things. 
We bore these accusations like the stoic guardsmen that we were. But some of the trainees felt the need to respond by accusing the agent and his trainees of ridiculous paranoia. Sarge quieted them down and reminded them that paranoia wasn't always a bad thing, and pointed out how often twitches had saved our lives. Being compared to Twitch did nothing to improve the agent's moods, and he stormed out with his trainees in tow. As he left, Doc ran out after him and apologized for our behavior and lack of useful findings. This might have mollified the agent, but Doc followed it with an assurance that everything would be sorted out when we got our appointment with the administratum. Once they were gone, everyone broke into laughter. Our trainees weren't stupid. They'd realized that we were playing with a stacked deck long ago. It had become the game. The stupider they thought we were, and the more time they spent chasing imaginary cultists, the funnier it would be when we proved them wrong. We went to sleep proud of our trainees. They were adopting the proper cynical guard outlook surprisingly fast. In the morning, we all went down to the administratum for the meeting. Most of the trainees were left outside, but Cutter's squad went in and we sat down and watched as they went through the questions. The head scribe assured us that there were no heretics, demons, or xenos around, and only a small number of minor mutants, according to the last census. As far as the disappearances went, they didn't know anything about slavers, and neither the PDF nor Mechanicus had filed for a recruitment sweep. However, a rogue trader with a permit to press gang had been cleared to operate in that area. And now that the scribe looked at it, there'd been a bit of a bureaucratic mix-up. Apparently, a key piece of paperwork had been misfiled during press ganging application process, and the local authorities hadn't been properly informed. So it was all just a misunderstanding. Imagine that. Someone just needed to get the press ganging crew to fill out the paperwork again, as well as deliver a new batch of identification badges to them. Since they'd somehow been issued some sort of decorative novelty pins covered with squiggly lines instead of the proper ones. To the apologetic head scribe's delight, and without any prompting from us, our trainees immediately volunteered to go get the papers signed and deliver the proper badges. After all, it was our duty to get this mess sorted as soon as possible. A few hours later, we were all drinking and laughing in the rather nice hotel, which the leader of the press gangers was staying at. The man was very apologetic once we explained all the trouble that had been caused by the little mix-up. He promised to make sure his paperwork was properly filed in the future, and invited us to have a few drinks in the hotel restaurant on him. A message was sent to the other team, telling them that we'd solved the whole mystery and recommended they head home. And then we let the trainees off the leash and had a nice chat with the press ganger while we waited. It took a while before someone on the other team came over to see what the hell our message was about, but none of us minded. When the sneaky-looking trainee poked his head into the restaurant, he saw all of our students having a pretty wild party while our squad sat like kings at feast. Cutter grabbed the little bugger the second we saw him, dragged him up to our table, and prompted the rather tipsy press ganger to explain the situation while Nubby filled the drink-induced blanks. The look on that trainee's face was priceless, and we all snickered into our beers as he scurried away to call his bosses. A short while later, the whole other training team was standing in front of us, in the middle of a party that was off several types of hooks, glaring at us like we kicked their mothers and slept with their pets, or vice versa. There was just a little bit of drinking going on. The other team didn't believe us at first. Hell, we wouldn't have believed us. It all looked too cut and dry, but there was more than enough proof. We had the official documents and permits, the logs from the shuttle that had taken the civvies away to their new and exciting lives aboard the trader's vessel, the note from the head scribe explaining the accident, and the press ganger himself beerily waving and confirming that it was all him. 
There were no cults, no secret societies, and no complex cover-ups. Well, at least there weren't any involved in the disappearances. It was all just bureaucratic mix-up. A simple mistake. Just like we said it was. It was glorious, watching their faces as it sank in. Seeing them go from disbelief, to anger, to utter disgust. We didn't gloat too much. There's such a thing as winning gracefully, but some of the inebriated trainees were a little less restrained. They might have made some very unpleasant enemies if the party's designated thinkers hadn't hauled them away in time. Once everything had sunk in and we considered the score suitably evened, we invited the other team to stay and party with us, but they made lame excuses about needing to go see to their own trainees. As they left, their leader, the suave agent fellow, swore that they had actually found a cult, even if it wasn't linked to the disappearances. Sarge told them to have fun with that, and asked them to give us a call if they needed some fire support when they located the heretics or whatever. Now that our point was made, we were done pretending to be even slightly interested in investigations. Our guests dealt with, we got down to the serious business of teaching our trainees how to hold a proper victory celebration. Super professional inquisitorial educators. That's us. <laughs>